You can take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Luke, chapter 16. How many of you would say, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, I have good news for you today. If you do believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I have good news. You want to hear the good news? You're rich. You are rich beyond your wildest imagination. And today we're going to look a little bit at your portfolio of your wealth in Jesus Christ. Now, wealth can be a little bit complicated. So I can only scratch the surface of your riches today. Only scratch the surface. I mean, if a wealthy person, I say, well, where's your wealth? They might have all these properties and it would be too complicated for them to explain all the details of their properties and their investments and, 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 and all their wealth combined. And so that's kind of like what I'm up against here today. Because last week I didn't finish my sermon. That's not unusual. <laughs> but what is unusual is today I'm not going to finish it. I thought I was going to finish it last week. When I finished my sermon, I'd say, come back, I'll finish the sermon. But when I started preparing the, this message, there was a part of the sermon that I felt I needed to preach. So this is like a sub point of the message of the sermon that uh, I was going to preach. I said, I want to preach this sub point. I don't want it to be a sub point. I want it to be the big point. And the big point is true riches. That's the big point. One point today in this message, true riches, your riches in Jesus Christ are incredible, but most people have not accessed them. Many Christians walk around as if they were poor. And I'm not talking about material riches. I'm not saying we're all materially rich. I'm talking about in Jesus Christ, who we are. We are spiritually rich in him. So let's look at the verses. And we looked last week at this parable of, it's often called the parable of the unjust steward. We could also call it the parable of the prodigal steward. Because like the prodigal son wasted his father's wealth, this steward wasted his master's wealth. And that's what it says in verse number one. He wasted the goods of his master. And then as we go down in the text though, Jesus is making application of this prodigal steward. Now remember, what does a steward own? Nothing. Nothing. He manages the wealth of his owner. And that's who we are in this world. We, in fact, own nothing, but, be, but, but we're still rich because our master is rich beyond compare. And he gives us full access to his riches. So that's why we're going to talk about true riches. So look at verse 9. And I'll read from there and down a few verses to verse 12. Luke chapter 16, 9 through 12. I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. And I'll just, just to review what we said last week, we said that this Jesus is teaching us to use our material resources, use our money to invest in the gospel, in kingdom work, so that souls can be saved, so that when we die, we will be welcomed in heaven by people who are there that we help get the gospel to. I received an incredible prayer letter this week from our missionary in Palawan, the Malakaus. It's a 14 page prayer letter and it just has page after page of God, God at work, souls being saved. And, and I don't know those people. They don't know me, but we've helped invest in their salvation. So that's what the Lord is saying there. Make, use your money to invest in the gospel. Verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is least, what is least? is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. You know, that's a basic principle that extends to every aspect of our life. Faithful people are what? Faithful. 
Unfaithful people are what? Unfaithful. If a faithful person has a little bit, he'll be faithful with what he has? The little bit. If a unfaithful person is unfaithful, even if he has a lot, he'll be unfaithful with a lot. So be a faithful person. Verse 11. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon. And what is that? That's the money of this world. The material wealth of this world. Who will commit to your trust the what? True riches. That's the message. The true riches. Who will commit to your trust? The true riches. If you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? So let's pray. So Father, thank you for this day now and use this time to glorify your name and help us to be faithful in this life that you can commit to us and we can have access to and live out the true riches that are ours in Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. So we said last week here that a Christian is a steward owning nothing but managing the affairs or the goods of our great master and our king in his kingdom work. And what Jesus is teaching us here is that in the light of God's kingdom, in comparison to the riches God has for us, the money of this world is not important. It's a small thing. That's what Jesus is saying. If you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? What, what riches are greater? The riches of this world or the riches God has for us? The riches God has for us. That's not how we live though most of the time. Look at verse 12. If you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, what does that mean? That means everything you own is whose? Another man's. <laughs> who is who? The Lord who gave you life. If we've not been faithful in the material things that the Lord has given to us, how will he commit to us the, the true riches? And verse, verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is least. What's least? Money. Money is a least thing to God. If you look down even in verse number 15. Look at the end of verse 15. He says, for that which is highly esteemed among men. What's highly esteemed among men in the context? Money. The world we're living in puts money way at the top and everything else second place by far, basically. Because money is power in this world. Money is freedom in this world. Money is access in this world. Money is huge. And one of the easiest things to do in this life is to get hung up on money. Am I right? It's, it's one of the easiest things to do in this life is to let money control you. Control your thinking. Control how you view yourself. It is so easy to get hung up on money as if that's the end of all things. Many people with little money live bitter and envious that they don't have more. Many people with a lot of money just think they have to have a little more too because somebody has more than them. No matter how much money you'll amass in this life, pretty much, except if you're Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or somebody like that, somebody's gonna have more of it than you. And even if you're those guys, you wanna make sure you have more of it than that other guy does. And is that, is that pretty, pretty true? Let me tell you something, money in comparison to God's true riches in God's sight is a little thing. It's least. He that is faithful in that which is least. But in this, what Jesus is teaching us here though, is money is least, it's a small thing, but it is a test. 
Because if you get hung up over money, he cannot commit to you the true riches. Money is a litmus test. That's that picture there, a litmus test. It's a litmus test of if we're faithful. Because if you're faithful in the small things, which is in this context, what? Money. You'll be faithful in the big things, which in this context is what? The true, true riches. The true riches of God. So if we're not faithful in the riches of this world, in the handling of money, then how can God commit to us the true riches? That's the question that is before you today. Are you faithful? Are you hung up over money? Do you handle your money by faith? Do you serve God with your money? Are you using it for kingdom enterprises? Now, money is a big part of all of our lives because you could not have made it here today without money. <laughs> it even took money to brush your teeth. So you could, you know, you didn't want to come to church unless you maybe brush your teeth or so. And plus all the other things you need to get here, right? So money is important. But it's still a little thing in comparison to the true riches. So you and your money, you earn it. You work for it or you can inherit it and then you can spend it, you invest it, you repay debts with it, you pay taxes with it, you can give it and you don't gamble it. I put gamble as something, eh. no. That's an addiction you don't want to have in your life. Don't gamble at all. So basically with your money, you can owe it and all of us do owe money. Even you, you know, I bought my house off a few years ago. I bought it. It's mine. No, it's not. <laughs> I still have to pay taxes. If I don't pay my property taxes, guess what they're going to do to my house? Take it away from me. <laughs> okay, so we really don't, I don't even own it, even though I supposedly own it. So you can owe it. You can grow it through savings, through investments. You live with it and you can give it. And again, handling money faithfully opens the door to the true riches that God has for us. And if you're not a spiritually minded person, I'm going to walk through some of our true riches here today. And I probably will bore you because, you know, you talk about economics, that can be maybe a boring thing in a way. But it's really the most exciting thing we can talk about. Our riches in Jesus Christ. So I want us to see the true riches that God will commit to his faithful stewards, you and I. And as we see these true riches in life, that we will realize how truly rich we are. And again, I can only scratch the surface. And I'm going to search and talking about our true riches. I'm, we're going to look at this word steward in relationship to our riches. Because we could talk about a lot of different riches as I looked at the Bible word of riches and it talks about the riches of God's goodness and forbearance and suffer, long suffering. The riches of his glory, the riches of his wisdom and knowledge, the riches of his grace, the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. But we, what we want to look at today is how God commits his true riches to faithful servants. And so let's look today. We're going to. It's going to be a topical message. That means we're going to look at at least four different texts. And okay, so I, I want to ask you to do this right off the bat. I'm going to tell you right up, right up front. We're going to look at different verses in the Bible. Do you have your Bible? Either on your phone or in a, in a paper? Do you have it? Let me see it. Okay. Okay. You got, okay. You got your, hey man, look at that. The church with a Bible. Okay. People brought their Bible to church. Isn't that good? People brought their Bible to Heritage Baptist Church. Just letting them know. Okay, so if I ask you to turn to a scripture, will you turn with me? Okay, because I really need you to do that. So I first want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And what we want is the first aspect of our riches is this. That we are possessors of God's mysteries. And this makes us rich in Jesus Christ. 
So I mentioned to you, this was like a sub point of my message that I wanted to deal with thoroughly. And then I started to search out this one matter of the rich of the, the riches of God's mis- mysteries and that we're possessors of the mysteries of God. And you know what I was confronted with? A whole nother sermon series. <laughs> so we could just summarize quickly the mysteries of God. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 1. Paul says, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So there's that word steward. You see it? That's from our parable of the unjust steward. We want to be faithful stewards in what? In in knowing and understanding the what? The mysteries of God. And the next verse he says, moreover, it is required that, that stewards be found faithful. So we have to be faithful in understanding the mysteries that God has given to us. Because these mysteries are truly rich. Now notice this text, by the way, where it says, account of us as the ministers of who? What does it say? Christ. And then he says, stewards of the mysteries of who? God. Christ and God. Jesus Christ is God. In other words, there's an equality to the persons here of God and Christ. This, like many verses of the Bible, teaches that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. And so this says that we're ministers of Christ. You know what this word literally goes to? This word speaks, and it's the only time I believe Paul himself uses it. This word speaks of a slave. Who rode in the bottom deck of a great Roman warship. A galley slave. Rowing in one of those huge ships. And that's all Paul said he was. A galley slave of Jesus Christ. A minister of the master. But not only that. A manager of the mysteries. Because he says I'm a steward. And remember a steward is a manager. He's understanding the value of what his master owns. And so we have we are managers of God's mysteries. That's an amazing statement. This passage of scripture. They're comparing. The Corinthians are comparing the different leaders in the church. Remember? Some preferred Apollos, some preferred Peter, some preferred Paul, and some, some people were super spiritual. They're actually the most dangerous. They're like, oh, I don't, I don't listen to any preacher. I just follow Jesus. They're the ones who say, I don't go to church anywhere. I just follow Jesus at home. <laughs> so, you know, there's these kinds of divisions people put up. And Paul says, what's Paul? Who's Apollos? Who's Peter? We're galley slaves. We're ministers. And we're stewards. We're managers of God's mysteries. We're just, we're like the off scouring, he even says in verse 13. The, we, we are like the scum of the earth. We're the filth of the world. The off scouring of all things. It's not about us. It's about the riches of Jesus Christ. So, it's an amazing statement that we are possessors, we are possessors of, we are stewards of, managers of the mysteries of God. And I'm going to quickly enumerate, enumerate them because there's various mysteries of God. Like I said, it's a whole sermon series, but I will enumerate them before we leave this point. So, we're ministers of the masters, of the master, Jesus Christ. We're managers of of the mysteries of God. So I want to go to another verse that speaks about these mysteries now. So go to Colossians. You told me you would turn. So I'm going to ask you to please turn to Colossians. Keep your word and be faithful. Amen. Okay. (laughs) See, I got you committed already. So this is good. All right. Colossians chapter one. So we're focusing on this word of a steward or stewardship. Now we're going to come into a word here in the epistles in our King James Bible. In the English translation, it's going to say dispensation. And that word dispensation means a stewardship. We are living in a particular dispensation of God. 
where God is managing the earth in a particular way. So the idea of a dispensation means a stewardship. So we're going to come into this word, but it means steward. It's the same root word that we're looking at from our parable of the unjust steward. Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 25. And I, I have it up here on the screen as well, but look at verse 25. It says, whereof I am made a minister according to the, what? Dispensation, according to the stewardship of God. In other words, I am just a minister because God has entrusted me with this job. And I'm a steward of this ministry, the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery. Oh, there's that word again. So he's, he's a steward in this, in this dispensation of the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Now, a mystery, real quick, a mystery in the Bible means simply this, something that was hidden, but now it's revealed, but it must be accessed, or if you will, uncovered by us to understand that mystery. So it was something hidden, but it's been revealed. But now for you to understand it, you have to have the Holy Spirit to help you. You need the revelation of God to open up your eyes to understand this mystery. So that's what Paul is saying there. The ministry has been, the, minis the mystery has been hid from ages and generations, but now it's shining, it's made manifest. The mystery is shining. What is the mystery here? He says, to whom God would make known. What is the what? Riches, there's our word. Our riches, true riches. So we have our word dispensation. We have our word, it's a mystery. And now we have our word riches. To whom God would make known, he says, the riches of the glory of this mystery. There's wealth in understanding this mystery. Am I, am I right? Is that true? Is that what this text says? He says, yes, there's riches that God would make known. What is the riches of the glory of this ministry among the Gentiles? Who are the Gentiles? Everyone who's not Jewish. How many here is a Gentile? You're not Jewish. Any Jewish people here? Oh, oh you Jewish? No, okay. okay. Oh yeah, you, you, you're, you're listening to the translation. God bless you. Okay. Yeah, so Gentiles. He said, this is for us. He says, this is a mystery of the riches among the Gentiles. And what's the riches we have? Which is what? What's it end to say in verse 27? Which is Christ in you the hope of glory that you have jesus christ living and dwelling in you by a spirit this is riches far beyond any amount of money that you can ever possess so the mystery when he says a mystery it's not like a murder mystery or a puzzle that you have to figure out it's a divine secret something once hidden but now revealed and something that can be now opened up to us by Jesus Christ and the teaching of his Holy Spirit. Do you understand? You can have Jesus Christ living in you and you can have power and love and peace and a sound mind. And look what he goes on just a little bit. Go into chapter two. Look at verse one. Just want to read these verses. For I would that you know what great conflict and agony. Literally, we get our word agonize and agony from that conflict. I have a view for of them at Laodicea and for many as have not seen my face in the flesh that their hearts might be com comforted being knit together in love unto all. And what's the next word after all riches unto all riches, the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the what the mystery of God. When you acknowledge the mystery of God, of Christ in you, the hope of glory, you can have the full assurance of understanding and the full assurance of your salvation. He says, and of God, and of the Father, and of Christ. Christ and God, the Father, are one distinct persons, but yet one in power, equal in glory. And now look at verse 3 here for the last verse of this section. 
in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So all the treasures, the, of the, I'm talking about the true riches, where are they? They're in Jesus Christ. Amen. And where is Jesus Christ? He's in you who believe. Access the power of Jesus Christ in your life. Okay, now there's one other scripture where we're going to talk about as we talk about we're possessors of God's mysteries. And it's in, go to Ephesians, please. And if you just go back in your Bible before Philippians and then Ephesians. And this is a very important passage talking about mystery because he, he references it a number of times. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually read from verse 2 to 10. From verse 2 to 10 in Ephesians chapter 3. So let me just kind of work through this. I won't take a long time explaining it, but I'd like to really read this and make a couple comments along the way. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Great. One of you guys are great, by the way. Praise the Lord. You love the word. If you have heard of the dispensation, there's that word. We get our word stewardship. It's the idea of the management. God's management of the household of faith. He says, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. Now, many times people call this the dispensation of grace. This is the dispensation of riches in Jesus Christ, Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's grace. The, the, the dispensation of the riches of God through Jesus Christ. God giving to us what we could never pay for or earn or ever deserve. Grace. It's the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. How that by revelation he hath made known unto me the what? Mystery. There's that word. He's made known to me. As I wrote before in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the what? The mystery of Christ. The, my the mystery is centered in the person of Jesus Christ. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. They didn't understand the fullness of the person of Jesus Christ. And then he says, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit, that the Gentiles, who's the Gentile? That's all of us, should be fellow heirs and of the same body, fellow heirs and of the same body with who? With the Jewish people. See, in the Old Testament, God specifically chose Abraham and chose to do his work primarily through one family to shine his light into the world because it was through that family that the Messiah would come. It was through the family of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that Jesus Christ was born. But now that Jesus Christ has been born, now it's clear that God wants Jews and Gentiles to be one, to trust in the one Savior of the world, the one Messiah. The one Lord who became man, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And so this is a mystery. It wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. It was hidden, but now it's revealed. And now the Holy Spirit has to show you the truth of this. He says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the what? By the gospel. What's the gospel? That Christ died, was buried, and rose again. It's through the gospel. Verse 7, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all saints. Paul saying, I'm nothing. I'm less than, the li th than any other Christian. I didn't deserve this calling. Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles? The unsearchable, what's the word? Riches. That's our word today. We're rich because we've been entrusted with God's mysteries. The unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of this mystery. The fellowship of Jew and Gentile in one body to worship Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ Jesus Christ is the creator along with the father to the intent that now this is, this is perhaps the center verse of the whole book of Ephesians to the intent that now 
unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Who's that? Those are the dark powers of evil, spiritual wickedness in high places. That now, even unto that, those places that he's going to talk about, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. That even those wicked spirits and powers in those heavenly places, as well as any good angels as well that may be there, might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, the wisdom and mysteries of God, the riches of God are made known to those evil spirits as well as the good spirits by the church <laughs> Woo. that's why we're here to make known God's wisdom so like I said this was a whole sermon series but if you want to get this and if I, I, I'm sorry maybe I shouldn't have made that green I don't know how well you can see that but these are the different Bible mysteries I'm just going to read them I won't belabor these the mystery of God's kingdom Matthew 13, those are the parable, the parabolic teachings of Jesus. He, he, he spoke in parables to reveal the mysteries. The mystery of faith and the divine incarnation. Great is the mystery of godliness. We have a faith that is a mystery. First Timothy 3, 9. The mystery of the divine indwelling of Christ. We looked at that verse, Colossians 1, The mystery of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. These are the mysteries that we've been entrusted with. We are possessors of these mysteries to understand them and to understand how rich we are to be possessors and then to try to convey these mysteries. The mystery of the body of Christ. We just read of that in Ephesians chapter 3. It was a mystery, but then revealed. The mystery of Israel's blindness. Romans eleven twenty five, the mystery of the rapture of the believers. Remember, Paul said, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. The mystery of the rapture, the mystery of God's will and his eternal purpose. We will, Lord willing, look at that. The mystery of iniquity, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. The mystery of the seven stars and golden lampstands, Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. The mystery of Babylon, the mother of harlots, Revelation 17. So those are some of the, the mysteries of which we are managers. And I will just say this, beloved. All these mysteries are revealed in the Bible. And we have an inspired Bible that's inerrant. That means it's without errors. It's, it was given by inspiration. God breathed it out. And God promised to preserve the words that he breathed out we have the word of God and we need to study the Bible we need to be in God's word we need to rejoice we need to delight ourselves in the scripture and when we open the Bible say God open up my heart open my eyes show me wondrous things out of thy law and and ask the Holy Spirit of God to teach you the word of God because he's the author of it we have him dwelling in us to help us understand the Bible and if you run across something, you say, I don't understand that. That's why we gather together. Talk to somebody. Ask somebody, what does this mean? Oh, we'd love to talk to you about that. We'd love to talk about the Bible. Amen? Amen. We love to try to and find answers. We don't have all the answers. But we love to search and seek. What made Moses so great in his life is he esteemed or valued the reproach, the sufferings of the Messiah coming, greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. That's what I'm saying today. The true treasures are in Jesus Christ. And what made Moses so great is he could have had all the treasures of the world. But he said the, tr the treasure of knowing Jesus and that he's coming as the Messiah of the world is greater than all the treasures of Egypt. So let's, let's understand these things. This wonderful possession, the possessors of God's mystery. The second thing is, we're preachers of God's gospel. Thankfully, my other points will not be as long as that one. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is actually our second main point now. The first point was we're possessors of God's mysteries. The second main point is we're preachers of God's gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And you know what? That you could tell somebody about Jesus. You know what that makes you? Rich. Rich. 
Because when you tell somebody about Jesus, you're, you're talking out of the overflow. You're talking out of the overflow. And, and it's the riches talking at that point. Your riches in Christ are sharing. Because he's been good to you and you can't keep it to yourself. And that's, that's Paul here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> Look please at verse 16. And, and the, the big thing Paul's dealing with is, is this in this passage, by the way. Why wasn't Paul getting paid? <laughs> Why was he doing what he was doing for free? Look at verse 16. He says, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. Paul didn't say, I don't want to receive any financial payment or remuneration so I can boast that I don't need your money. That's not, it wasn't his motive. It wasn't his, that wasn't his reason. He says, I have nothing to glory of for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me. If I preach not the gospel, this good news that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. The heart of the Bible is the gospel. And then he says, for if I do this thing willingly, I have reward. But if against my will, and here's our word, a dispensation of the gospel, a stewardship of the gospel is committed to me. Paul saw, and we saw the gospel is one of the mysteries, the mystery of the gospel. And now he's saying here that the gospel has been entrusted, committed to him as a steward. And he had to be a faithful steward with what? The gospel. Now, my question that I thought as I looked at this, first I asked myself, what does Paul mean when he says, if against my will? Did Paul like preach, like, I really don't want to preach today, Lord. I don't want to go to Ephesus. And he went to Ephesus against his will. Is that what he's talking about? I don't think so. It's not like I had to preach today and I'm like, Lord, I really don't feel like preaching today, but I'll do it anyway. No, that's not at all Paul's point. In fact, his point is, what was Paul's attitude toward preaching in verse number 16? What's his heart? He had such a deep need put upon him, a necessity, he says, literally an agony, a deep burden of responsibility. He could not help but to speak. And he even says, whoa, may I be destroyed like Babylon is going to be destroyed one day. Woe is upon Babylon and woe will be upon me if I do not preach the gospel. So my question, and I put it here. Where did this fire Paul had to preach the gospel come from? Where was this fire of desire? Where was this sense of, I need to preach the gospel. I can't live if I don't preach the gospel. And he, he, his fire of desire was, I'm going to go preach the gospel today because I'm looking forward to payday. No, he, there was no payday for him. He wasn't being paid. He had a fire in his heart to preach. And I asked myself, Lord, I would like this fire. Where did this fire come from? Where did it come from? Well, as I said, it wasn't because he was getting paid. It wasn't because Paul thought of this message himself. He said, man, I thought of such a good message. I can't wait to tell everybody. Did Paul think of this message? Is the gospel his, of his Contriving? No, it's the gospel of God. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is rooted all the way from the book of Genesis and it goes all the way to the book of Revelation. That Jesus Christ had to come and suffer for the sins of the world as the Lamb of God and then rise again as the prophet said in prophecy in 700 and thousand years before Christ came and then Jesus Christ came and actually did it and then God saved Paul and he called him to preach the gospel so the message wasn't Paul's creative idea that's not where his fire came from neither did the fire to preach the gospel come because Paul said oh I got such a great sermon this week I thought of some really creative words that are going to make everybody think how smart I am. 
No. Paul says, I don't use fancy words when I preach. I'm not here to, to make you think how smart I am. As he said, even in 1 Corinthians and in chapter 2, he says, I determined only to know Jesus Christ and him crucified among you. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. So where did this fire of desire come from? Did it come from the fact that Paul said one day, he, Paul woke up and he said, you know what? I want to become a preacher. Did Paul wake up one day and say, oh, I want to become a preacher. And did his fire come from that he just woke up and said, oh, I want to be a preacher. No. Paul didn't wake up one day. And that's what I believe against my, his, the will. Paul's saying here that on that Damascus road, <laughs> I think it's going to the Damascus road. When he says in verse number 17, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. In other words, we don't have to have a Damascus road experience like Paul. But if against my will, I believe he's talking about the Damascus road. That when Paul was on that Damascus road, he wasn't thinking, I'm going to go into Damascus and preach Christ. <laughs> He was going into Damascus to persecute, arrest, and do damage to the church and to Christians. And so, Paul's saying here he had no will. It was not his will that called him. It was Jesus Christ who called him on that Damascus road. But I believe what Paul is saying here is this, and it's a secret to his great life. And at least it's a part, I'm not saying it's the only source of the fire in his soul, but at least in this passage of scripture, is that Paul had a deep sense of responsibility that he had received a dispensation, that is a stewardship, that Jesus Christ on the Damascus road committed the gospel to him and said, go and preach and preach to the Jews and preach to the Gentiles and preach to the kings. And this was given to him by Jesus Christ himself, the Lord who's alive. And that's where the fire came from. It's because Jesus gave it to him. Let me ask you. Do you know. That whether Jesus Christ has come to you. And saved you. And given you the gospel. Then you must. For his sake. There will be a divine necessity. Laid upon your soul. And a fire burning in you. To proclaim that message. The third thing is this, the true riches, we are preachers of the gospel. We have received a stewardship of the gospel committed to us by Jesus himself, church. And here we are in this great community, this great city that needs Jesus. There's no shortage of souls. Amen. Amen. May God put a fire in our heart. May God put a fire in your soul. I pray that God will put this fire in me. Because God manifests his word through preaching. It says in Titus chapter 1 verse 3. Put that verse in your notes. But now let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. And here Peter talks about how we have the riches. Not only are we possessors of God's mysteries. And preachers of God's gospel. But we are ministers with divine giftedness so first Peter chapter 4 and let's just read verse 10 and 11 he says as every man hath received the gift that's a spiritual gift he's talking about now even so minister the same one to another as good what stewards there's our word as good stewards, we're searching that word steward or stewardship in connection with our riches. And I'm saying by this point here that we are rich because when we were saved, we received a gift, a spiritual gift. And now we are to minister one to another as good stewards of the manifold, what's the word? Grace, those are the riches. The grace of God, the riches of his grace. And then he says, I'll just read verse 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the word of God, the oracles. I love that word actually, that's interesting, beautiful word. The oracles, the very word of God. Speak the word of God. 
By the way, we all have our opinions. I have a lot of opinions. I try not to share too many of them with you. I, I'm here to preach the Word of God, I assure you. In this day and age of such culture clash and division, we are united here believing the Bible is the Word of God and we're here to preach the Word. Oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be what? Glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. So the question I have here is, as ministers with divine giftedness, we have been gifted by God to serve. What is the best way to determine your spiritual giftedness? Now, you have a spiritual gift if you're saved. You, if you are saved, you're a minister of Jesus Christ. That's the word that he uses there. If any man minister, is he talking to the pastors here? No, Paul, Peter in chapter 5 talks to the pastors. He calls them elders. Here he's talking to the Christians, the believers. And he says, if any man minister, and you know what the word is? We get our word deacon from that word minister, diakonos. Now, obviously, a deacon, there's an office of a deacon, but here he's using the word in a general sense. You don't, in other words, you don't have to have the position of, the, of a deacon in the church to be a deacon. In other words, to do ministry. Who's to do ministry? Who's to do ministry? Everybody. Why? Because you have a spiritual gift. You have a spiritual gift. You say, well, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what it is. Well, I'll find out what it is. And minister. Do something. This is a body. Is there any part of your body that's just hanging there not doing anything? No, doctors say, oh, you don't need your appendix. <laughs> yeah, you do need your appendix. When I was a kid, they used to take out people's uh, tonsils all the time. Oh, he got his tonsils out. All my friends had their tonsils out. And they realized, no, don't take the tonsils out. You, you need them. I'm glad I never had my tonsils out. So I'm so healthy. <laughs> but, uh... You're a minister. Say, I am a minister of Jesus Christ. That's right. We're all here to serve. In Jesus Christ, you are a gifted minister. How does that make you feel? You're rich. You are rich to serve and minister for Jesus Christ. Every believer is a gifted minister of Jesus Christ. So you say, but I, I don't know what my gift is. Well... What's the best way to determine your giftedness? It's not to go home and say, okay, Lord, what's my spiritual gift? <laughs> oh, I didn't hear him say anything. I, maybe I don't have one. No, that's not the way to do it. Don't go home and, and expect the Lord to hit you over the head with a baseball bat and tell you what your spiritual gift is. You know, the best way to find your spiritual gift is you do what? Get involved in ministry. Do something. And if you may do something, you'll say, well, I didn't enjoy that. Well, then do something else. Maybe that wasn't in the area of your giftedness. Do something else. And keep search, searching, keep serving, and keep being involved in service and ministry. We have a wonderful church of servants, too. I remember a couple years ago when it was 9-11, we passed out tracks. It's like half the church or more came and we filled up the front of all the people who passed out tracks. Remember that on 9-11? the 20th anniversary. And then last week, we had all the people stand here who've been involved in the radio. It was more than half the church, I think, came forward and say, I've been involved in that ministry. That's a wonderful thing. I thank God for, for the minister's heart. So I'm preaching to you, yeah, as if you don't, but I know you do. I know many of you do, okay? But some of you still are maybe hanging out and hanging back. Exercise your gift. So I say, as for me and my house, be like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will what? Serve the Lord. So I say, embrace your gift. Because he says, every man has received the gift. Exercise this gift by grace. As good stewards of the manifold. Do you know what manifold means? That's not a part of your car, which I don't know what it does. The manifold. Isn't that a part of a car? I don't know what the manifold does in a car. But this word manifold means the multifaceted, the diverse ways God's grace works in our lives. 
His grace is so multicolored and multifaceted. Like his rainbow, God's rainbow, for his glory. So embrace your gift, exercise it by grace, and then exalt in the glory of God that God would be glorified through your gift. Verse 11, that God in all things may be glorified. Okay, I, I'm not going to finish this sermon next week, so we're going to go to the last point, which is Ephesians. Now, you've got to go to Ephesians because this is the culmination. This is amazing. Ephesians chapter 1. How many of you would agree with me that this world is very divided, confused, at war? Aren't we at a, a world at war? I mean, this world is truly a place of sadness, sorrow, corruption, confusion, frustration, and division. But I have good news for you. We're rich because... Jesus Christ is coming. <laughs> and we can be a part of the Jesus administration. Whoever's, you know, it's the Biden administration. Before that, it was the Trump administration. Before that, it was the Obama, Bush, Clinton, all those other presidents. But Jesus is coming. And we can be a part of the Jesus administration. And there's going to be great unity in the Jesus administration. Look at what I'm talking about, Ephesians chapter 1. Now, just mark this in your Bible. What does it say in verse 3? He has blessed us. This is why, why I had Justin read this passage earlier. See, he has blessed us with spiritual blessings. Verse 4 says he has what? Chosen us. Mark that. Blessed us. Chosen us. Verse 5 says he has what? Predestinated us. Verse 6 says he has made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7, it doesn't have the word us, but the idea there is he has redeemed us. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches. There's the word riches of his grace. Verse 8, wherein he has abounded toward us. He's abounded toward us with all wisdom. And then verse 9, he has made known unto us. Did you follow that? If he has blessed you, chosen you, predestinated you, made you accepted, forgiven you and redeemed you, and then abounded toward you, and he has made known unto you wisdom. You know what you are? Rich. <laughs> Rich. The true riches, because we're looking forward to Jesus coming back. And verse 9 and 10, I will read these verses. It says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure. Again, there's that word mystery. You see the word mystery? This is one of the mysteries we're entrusted with. The mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, wherein he hath purposed in himself. Verse 10, and here's our word. That in the dispensation, what's that word? Stewardship. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. So what is this talking about? It's talking about a future dispensation of time called the millennium. We call it the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. That in the, he says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. You see, Paul is, Paul is saying that God, according to his will, has purposed to one day sum up all of human history and bring history to a great culmination with the coming of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ comes, he will establish his millennial kingdom on earth. This is the fullness of the times that is going to come. And when he has gathered together the world and Jesus Christ is going to sit on the throne of David. This will be the great culmination of human history. Paradise lost. 
will become paradise restored by Jesus Christ on earth. This is the dispensation of the fullness of times. Jesus Christ is going to sit on his throne. The great plan of the ages has unfolded. History is his story. And when Jesus comes back, every knee shall bow to him. And Jesus will be the Lord over all the earth. Zechariah chapter 14 says, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. The Lord shall be king. That's Jesus Christ will be king over all the earth. And, and, and it says in that day there will be one Lord and his name one. And this divided world so torn with war will be united by Jesus Christ. The United Nations will not bring this to pass. Jesus Christ coming will unite the nations. And that's what it says right outside the United Nations when they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And they will vet. only when Jesus Christ comes and rebuilds his temple in Jerusalem and sits on the throne of David will there be peace in the nations so that the nations will beat their swords into farming equipment. <laughs> Until then, they're going to be building bombs and bigger bombs and bigger warheads and faster jets and planes and more drones and more things to kill and destroy. Is that true? Yeah. That's what's going to happen. That's what the, the world we're living in. Wow. So this world is groaning in the bondage of corruption. But one day there will be harmony. That's what he's saying. There's going to be a harmony. He will gather together in one and there will be one Lord and his name one and the nations will worship him. We will all go to Jerusalem. There won't be Baptists and Methodists and Lutherans. There won't be Democrats and Republicans. There, there won't be liberals and conservatives. There won't be all of the divisions and all the name call, all the name calling today. Oh. There won't be any lies. There will be truth. And Jesus will reign. And harmony will be, res be restored. And this is what everyone wants. The most loving and the, the only loving, the only perfect king will be an absolute despot over the world. And he will rule with a rod of iron, but in absolute holiness and love. And there will be peace and righteousness in the world. So what I'm saying with all of this is, and then we close. We are closing by going to Luke, back to Luke. Here we go. Chapter 19. The groaning world will one day be in harmony when Jesus establishes his kingdom. And when he comes to establish his kingdom... Where are you going to be? Where are you going to be? What are you going to be doing in his kingdom? You know, this world loves power. Don't you agree? They, this world loves political power. Just think of all the millions and billions of dollars people spend to become president. Or even to become a senator now. Or, or to be a, in the House of Representatives. They spend millions and millions of dollars on a particular race. To win that race. When Jesus comes back, you can have a part in his administration and you don't have to, you don't have to run for an office. Because look what Jesus says, Luke chapter 19 and verses 16 and 17. This is another parable, but it's the same point as going back to our parable of the unjust steward. In Luke chapter 19, 16, he says, Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, can you read verse 17 with me? And he said unto him, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over 10 cities. And it talks about in the book of Revelation that we are going to sit with Jesus on his throne, ruling with him. And here Jesus indicates that when he comes back, he will give his faithful children who have been faithful in little things. He will give you much and you will have ruling authority with Jesus Christ in his kingdom. 
that will last for a thousand years. And you won't ever have to run for office every four years. No one's going to impeach you or get you out. No one's going to complain. Jesus put you in that place and you'll stay in that place. Hallelujah. We're rich in Jesus Christ. He's coming again. His kingdom is coming and we will rule with him. Praise God how rich we are. Let's stand together as we pray.